It's great to see you again. Mark here from the Church of Christ in Beaverton. We're located at 11775 Southwest 5th Street, Beaverton, Oregon. You can contact us at 503-644-9017. See us on the web, beaverinchurchofchrist.net. We live in a world of a lot of doubt these days uh, among not just religious people. Uh, not all scientists agree about things. Big debate whether there is or isn't climate change and global warming. Um, there are scientists that don't believe in God, and there are a lot of scientists who do believe in God. There are scientists that ascribe to evolution, and others hold to intelligent design and other theories. There are all sorts of issues out there that people disagree about. I'm intrigued that when you look at Jesus, though, you don't find that about Jesus. Uh, you do not find Jesus someone who speculates or guesses about things or doubts about things. And neither did Jesus walk around raising doubts about things. In the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23, Jesus told his generation, You serpents, you brood of vipers, how shall you escape the sentence of hell? And there are no apologies made for that. Uh, Jesus embraced the concept of hell without any apologies, uh, without any doubts. He didn't doubt, never doubted its duration, how long it was. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Verse 46, these will go away into eternal punishment. No apology, uh, no question, no speculation about that. Just how long is hell, Jesus? It's eternal. How long is the fire? It's eternal. How long is the punishment? It's eternal. In Mark chapter 9, verse 43, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than having two hands to go into hell into the unquenchable fire where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And then he'll repeat that two more times. In Jesus, we do not have someone who doubts the reality of hell, its eternal nature. nature. There, there are no thoughts about whether it is just or fair. There is no, it is simply stated as fact. He did not speculate about hell being annihilation, where eventually you would maybe immediately cease to exist, or maybe you would cease to exist after a number of centuries, or the fire burning out, or the wicked eventually ceasing to exist after time. He never pondered, he never brought up the question, how could a loving God allow anyone to end up there? No apologies, simply stated as fact. In the book of Luke chapter 16 and verse 25, when the rich man ends up in torment and he wants some mercy from Lazarus, just a little bit of water on his tongue, Abraham says, child, remember, remember that during your life you received your good things. What's that mean? Well, among a number of things is remember God was kind to you. God was merciful to you. You were given many opportunities to obey and change and do the right thing. Remember the good that was given to you. Remember, you did, you, you did not end up lost by accident. It was your choice. You ended up lost after spurning time after time, God trying to reach out to you through individuals and through the message that you had readily available to you, Moses and the prophets. And you rejected it. And so there are just no apologies made about any of that. In addition to that, there is no speculation about there being any second chances after death. Any second chances to get your life right with God. In Matthew 25, we have three stories. Three stories about the final judgment. The first one, the virgins. The five, the, the, the foolish virgins and the wise virgins. Yet, 
In verse 10, it says that the five wise ones went into the wedding feast and the door was shut. The others show up and says, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he says, truly I say to you, I do not know you. There's no second chance there. In the parable of the talents, the man that was given the one talent and he squandered it. It says in verse 30, cast out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Sounds like ongoing conscious suffering. Does it sound like annihilation? There is no second chance. In the third story of the sheep and the goats, there's no second chance there either. Verse 41, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which prepared for the devil and his angels. There is no second chance in any of those stories. There is no even inference of a second chance or hint at one. In Luke chapter 16 and verse 26, there we have this statement. And besides all this, between us and you, there was a great chasm fixed in order that those who wish to come over from here to you may not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. There's no second chances there as well. When it comes to God's Word in Scripture, it's kind of interesting as far as what Jesus said about the Bible or Scripture, the accuracy of Scripture. There is no apology for Scripture. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 18, Truly I say to you, until heaven and earth shall pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law, until all is accomplished. That is, Jesus is saying that the law, now the law of Moses, the, at least the first five books, were like 1,400 years old when Jesus was upon the planet. And yet, he says the law that existed in his time was the word of God right down to the smallest letter or mark of punctuation. It had been accurately translated for 1,400, 1,500 years. And it was the scriptures that existed there in the first century that people had access to. Uh, human opinion had not crept into it. Uh, it was the Word of God. It was the Word of God just like when it first came off the press. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus will quote from a verse in the Old Testament, Exodus 3.6. And that's quoted in verse 32. But before that, Jesus will say to his generation, some 1,400 years later after Exodus 3, 6 is spoken and recorded, but regarding the resurrection of dead, have you not read that which was spoken to you by God? God spoke it to you. They weren't around when God spoke it, but it was still God speaking to them. 1,400 years of history had passed between the events of Exodus 3 and Jesus' generation. And yet Jesus said, when you pick up Exodus 3, 6, that's God speaking to you. Modern application is that about 2,000 years have passed since the New Testament was written. Doesn't matter. That's still God speaking to you when you pick it up and read it. And there's no apologies made for that statement. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Right there, Jesus is saying that his words are more durable and certain, and the words that he spoke that would end up in your New Testament are more durable and certain than the earth that you stand on and that the universe that surrounds it. The universe and the earth will pass away, but God's word will never pass away. It has perpetual validity. And there's no apology made for that statement. Jesus is right there saying that every generation will have his words, and they will be his words, and they will be accurate, and it will have been accurately translated, and it will not have been corrupted over time. In Luke chapter 10 of verse 26. There is also no doubt about whether a person can understand the Bible. Luke chapter 10, verse 26, a man comes up to him and says in the previous verse, verse 25, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? 
Good question. What do I need to do to go to heaven? But Jesus did not give him a detailed answer as far as step by step. Jesus simply said, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? What did God say? What's the law say about that? Right there, Jesus said, that's a good question. What should I do to go to heaven? The Bible answered that. The Bible already has an answer to that. It's a clear answer. If you just read it, you'll find the answer. Interesting, the man did. 27, 28, 29, the man did find the answer. The man said, well, here's what's written in the law, and Jesus said, you've answered correctly. Do it, and you'll live. Not complicated, is it? In Matthew chapter 15 and verse 10, there Jesus would pause and he would say this, hear and understand. Listen to what I'm saying and understand it. And it's understandable to everyone. Matthew, Mark 16, 15, Jesus said, go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Why preach it to every creature? Because every creature can understand it. Then it says, he that believeth. So anyone who hears the gospel can believe it. And it is more than sufficient warning. It's all the evidence you need. In Luke chapter 16, the rich man wants Abraham to send Lazarus back to frighten his brothers and convince them to change their lives. And Abraham says, no, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. All the evidence you need to believe in God, all the evidence you need to obey the gospel to become a Christian, everything you need to produce faith in your heart is already written down there. It is more than sufficient evidence. And so there is absolutely no speculation about whether Scripture is reliable, relevant, understandable, truthful, there's no speculation about whether human opinion has entered into the text. Jesus simply said, thy word is truth, John 17, 17. He did not say, thy word is about 50% truth. Just thy word is truth. And as I said, he did not doubt about whether people could understand Scripture. He, he did not say, well, you know, every one of us comes from a different background, a cultural background. We're all raised by different parents. We are, we're all given kind of a set of colored glasses, like cultural lenses, lenses of our upbringing, lenses of different ways of looking at the world. And everyone comes to the Bible with like a different set of lenses, and therefore we can really never agree in what it says. He didn't say that. Kind of makes you wonder about the motivations of the people that do say that. Why would they say that? Why would they try to create this scenario where we're confused? Is it they want us to believe them and follow them? Want us to read their book? Want us to kind of be their slave? Is that kind of what's going on? Are people looking for disciples? Hey, all I want to do is follow God. I don't want to follow any man. It's interesting when it comes to understand. I mean, there's a number of people out there, all sorts of theories on Oh, you know, everyone sees it, sees it differently. What is true for you is not true for me. Jesus never said that. Kind of makes you wonder about the motivations of people that say it today. Why would a person ever say that? And people really don't believe that. Two plus two is four. They don't think that everyone has a different view of two plus two. They don't. Science would end tomorrow if people thought that there was no absolute truth. Your teacher your professor in college, they, they might kind of say there's no absolute truth, but they actually give grades. Those are grades. There's a standard there. They believe in absolutes after all, don't they? And you get pulled over, people are going to give you a ticket if you go too fast. Are you being judged by an absolute standard? Yes, you are. The building inspector comes and says, you didn't do that wiring right. Is, are there absolutes? You bet there are. Let's go a little farther. In John chapter 17 and verse 17, if any man is willing to do his will, he shall know of the teaching. Whether it is from God, if that's the source or origin, 
or whether I speak for myself, whether I'm just making this up. You see, the key there is, are you willing to do it? Do you have a good heart? Are you honest? Jesus says anyone who really wants to do the truth, anyone who really wants to follow God, when they pick up the Bible, they will understand whether this is the truth or just some man's opinion. In John chapter 8, about one chapter over, 31, if you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. If you do what it says, then you're a real Christian. You shall know the truth. If you follow scripture, you'll know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. In John chapter 18 and verse 37, when Jesus was before Pilate, we're not done yet here, are we? Jesus said, you say correctly that I'm a king. For this I've been born. For this I've come into the world. To bear witness to the truth, I've come here to agree with the truth or testify about the truth or proclaim the truth. Everyone who is of the truth, what's that mean? It means someone who's a truth lover, someone who wants the truth. Everyone who's of the truth hears my voice, obeys it. Not too complicated, what is it? You take those passages, what is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying that anyone who really wants to know the truth will find it. Anyone who loves the truth will, will know it. Anyone who follows my word, they will know. They will know the truth, and the truth will set them free. If you really want to do it, and you know what? That's interesting in John 17, 17, if anyone's willing to do his will. You know why, what, you know why people reject truth? It's never an intellectual problem. It's never a lack of evidence. It's always a moral issue. It's always a free will issue. It's always, an, it's always a submission issue, an obedience issue. People reject the Bible because they simply don't want to do it. They simply don't want to pay the price of being a moral, upright person. That's what Jesus said. If anyone's willing to do his will, he'll know. He'll know. If you don't want to do it, well, then you'll have some problems. So obeying and understanding Scripture and obeying and understanding God is simply a matter of being willing to obey the truth, willing to do the work, willing to be a truth lover, willing to love truth more than your want or need for immediate gratification at the moment. Willing to be unselfish. He did not doubt whether there was only one way to God or not. A number of people, Oprah, Oprah even doubts that. They're, they're just put, there couldn't possibly be just one way to God. Why not? You know, a lot of people will say, you know what's dying in our country? Faith is dying in our country. Religion's dying in our country. No, it isn't. This morning when I came to work, I passed one church after another when I came to work. And that's in Oregon. That's a pretty non-religious state. Yes, they may not all be serving God, but they're there. They believe something. 96% of the American population believes in God. Faith isn't dying in our country. We got all sorts of religions. We've got some religions in this country or they're more prominent in this country that were not around when I was a kid. There are people wearing head coverings in schools and scarves and things like that. They weren't there when I was a kid. There's all sorts of religion in this country. You know what is dying in this country? It's reason. It's logic that is dying in the country. The idea when people say, well, there, there couldn't just be one way to God. Why not? What would logically demand that there be more than one way? If there is one God, and if that one God sent his son Jesus to die for our sins, and if he is the savior of the world, why would there not be just one way? Now give me a logical reason why the one God who gave his one son would give more than one way. Again, faith isn't dying in our country. Logic is. Reason is dying. The ability of people to think clearly is what's dying. 
Jesus said, I'm the one, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but through me, John 14, 6. Jesus had no doubts about whether there was one way to God or not. He was one who talked about the broad way and the narrow way, Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14. And there's no apologies, no apologies for that. There's no speculation about whether, well, will some on the broad way eventually make it? No, no speculation about that. Either on the narrow way or on the broad way. You're on the, either on the way that leads to life or the way that leads to destruction. Also, Jesus did not question the importance of obedience. Uh, a lot of people speculate about, well, what if I'm a good person but I don't believe in Christ? What if I'm a good person but I don't end up obeying as well? Would I make it? Well, what did Jesus say? In Matthew chapter 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but who does the will of my Father is in heaven. Well, someone who would say, Lord, Lord, would be a very religious person, probably would profess to be a Christian. And if there's a problem here, they say it, but they don't do it. And Jesus said, if all you're doing is saying it, but you don't obey, you don't make it. Many will say to me in that day, Jesus says, hey, wake up call here. Here's going to be something true at the judgment day. There's going to be a lot of people at the judgment day. Many, many, not a few, many. Many are going to come up to, and say to me, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. They're going to point out to the Lord all the things they did, all the good things they did, all the good works they did. And Jesus is going to say in verse 23, I, I declared, I, will, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye who work lawlessness. There's no second chance there. Is there? What are these people running around telling people there's going to be a second chance of the judgment? Where did they get that? Where did they get that scripture? Haven't they read this clear passage? Makes you wonder about their motivation. Let's go a little farther here. Whoa, whoa. But, but Jesus, what if someone's a good person and, and then they give a lot of money to the poor and they're a humanitarian and things like that, but they don't believe in you and, and, and they don't really obey what you say? Will they make it? No. No. What if someone is religious and they profess to be Christian and, and they're really zealous and, and, and they, they're talking about praise God all the time and, and they're talking about what you're doing for their life, but they, but they don't obey you? Do they make it? No. What about someone who's really religious and they make all sorts of sacrifices, but they're not really the sacrifices that Jesus wants them to make and, and they're worshiping God in a way that's really impressive, but that's not really the worship that God wants them to give. Do they make it? No. What, what, what about people out there and they got this church and it's huge and it's had thousands of people and, and they praise God and talk about Jesus and it's ornate and stuff like that, but they're not really doing what the Bible says. Do they make it? No. No. I never knew you. Depart from me. What part, of that, what part of that don't you understand? What part of not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my Father's name? What part of that verse don't you get? What part of that verse is hard to understand? There's no need for speculation, is there? No, that, that's said without any apologies, isn't it? Jesus doesn't apologize when he said that. Some people might doubt whether you can really obey God or not, but Jesus never doubted whether a person can obey God or not. You ever run into someone who says, well, you know what, we're all just probably in sin in a different area. We're just probably all disobeying God. I mean, we can't really do everything it says. All of us are probably wrong about some point. Did Jesus ever say that? No. Jesus never said that. In fact, in verse 24, he says, Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them, can a man do what the Bible says? Can you do the will of the Father? Can you do it? Jesus said you could. And that's not the only passage. John 14, 15. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Well, what's that tell you, what's that tell you about people out there who are not keeping God's commandments? They don't love God. Is that clear? How about this? And that's not the only one. John 14, 23. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. It's not if you love me, you might keep my word. or it could. He will. He will. Which means if you're not keeping God's word, you don't love him. 
cut and dry, no apologies. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. John 15, verse 10, which means if you don't keep his commandments, you won't abide in his love. Now, I know you run into people who say, you know, I, I'm not doing what it says here, but I got the love of Jesus in my heart. And God says, liar. You know you don't. I mean, why would people say that? Why would people say that they love God even though they're not doing what God says? Why would they do that? It makes you wonder about their motivation. Are they, don't tell me they're, they're trying to be a poser. They're just trying to be a pretender. Are they? Now, I know a lot has been written about marriage and divorce and who can remarry and things like that. Whole oh, volumes of books have been written about that. But Jesus didn't give volumes about that. Jesus was actually asked that question, Matthew 19, verse 3. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause at all? The topic came up. The topic came up. What did he say? I mean, who does this apply to? Verse 9. I say to whoever. Okay, so that's settled. Jesus is God's law on divorce and marriage and remarriage applies to everyone. In fact, that's all even pointed out in verse 8. From the beginning, when they tried to go back and say, well, this doesn't seem to drive with something in the past, he says, no. From the beginning, from the beginning. God's law has been from the beginning. That means it applies to everyone. In Matthew chapter 5 and in verse 32, I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, it applies to everyone. What part of everyone don't you understand? Now, the world might think that there's all sorts of different reasons that you have for divorcing your mate. That's not what Jesus said. I say to whoever divorces his wife except for immorality, the word there means sexual immorality, that's the only exception given. The only time that you have a right to divorce your mate is if they've been sexually immoral, if they've cheated on you. Same thing is true in Matthew 5, 32, except for the cause of unchastity or fornication, sexual immorality. And there's no, no apologies given. Well, aren't there more causes than that? Like, what if she gets really big or something like that? Or what if she, what if she gets like an egg or something like that? Or what if he gets really lazy and won't get a job? And stuff? No, no, you can't divorce him. What if he doesn't take a bath? No, you can't divorce him. And there's no apologies. What part of what part of except for immorality don't you understand? Jesus is clear or not. He doesn't speculate, well, there, there might be all sorts of different reasons and things like that. What, what part of that don't you understand? I mean, Jesus is God. He knows all the messes that people can get themselves into, and yet he only gives one cause. Now, he also shows that divorce affects everyone. First of all, in Matthew 5, 32, I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except for the cause of unchastity makes her commit adultery. So if you put away your wife and she was not unfaithful to you and she marries someone else, guess what? That affects her. Now she's in adultery. Well, what about the person who marries her? In the Matthew 5, 32. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. You put away your husband. He was not unfaithful to you. He remarries. He commits adultery. Whoever marries him, maybe a woman who's never been married before, whoever marries him, now she's in adultery. Now we got, okay? So the person who is unlawfully put away and they remarry, they're in sin. The person who marries them, they're in sin. And how about you? You put them away unlawfully. They did not cheat on you. And you go out and marry somebody else? Matthew 19, verse 9. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman, so now it's you. You put them away. They did not cheat on you. You had no cause to put them away. But now you go out and remarry. And marries another woman, 
commits adultery, now you're in sin. An unlawful divorce affects everyone involved. Don't tell me that your life just affects you. Now, the disciples clearly understood what Jesus was driving at. They say in verse 10, if the relationship of Matthew 19, 10, if the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, like what you just said, it is better not to marry. If you can't put your wife, put away your wife for any reason, if you can only put away your wife if she's cheating on you, and the percentage of women who cheat on their husbands is not huge then it would be better not even to get married. They clearly understood what Jesus is driving at. But he said to them, not all men can accept this statement, not the statement of verse 9. All men have to accept that statement. But the statement of verse 10 is better not to marry. Jesus said, not everyone's cut out to live the single life. Then he says this, Verse 11, excuse me, verse 12. Here comes the thief. <coughs> there may be another one. Nope, there wasn't. That was just a single shot. Okay. For there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb. Some men never marry because of genetic defects. There are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. Some men don't marry because they've been forced to be a eunuch. They've been castrated. And then there are also eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. That's your third category. That category is men and women who realize that in order to make it to heaven, they can't marry again. Because either they divorced a mate, not for fornication, or they were put away. They were put away, and it was not a lawful putting away. And they're, they're just stuck. Their marriage fell apart. Nobody cheated. There was no cheating there. They just went their separate ways. They realized they don't have a scriptural divorce. They left their mate. They left their mate. Their mate didn't cheat on them. They don't have a scriptural divorce. They don't have a right to remarry. Some people realize that if I'm going to make it to heaven, then I can't be married because I messed up the marriage I had. That's what Jesus says there. No apologies is made for any of that. No doubt. No speculation. Just there it is. You know, I, I don't find Jesus ever undermining or doubting the ability on the part of mankind to understand Scripture and obey it and find unity based on it. Jesus did not bring up a whole bunch of hypo hypothetical what-ifs. He didn't do that. He didn't try to confuse people with a bunch of hypothetical what-ifs. When people tried to do that with Jesus, and they tried to, they tried to bring up a bunch of hypotheticals with Jesus, where other people disagreed, Jesus always found the right answer. And you know where it was? It was in Scripture, where it had always been. There were a number, I mean, there, there are big controversies today, religious controversies, and there were big controversies in the first century. And they were brought to Jesus. In John 4.20, the Samaritan woman came up with the controversy. The Samaritan said Mount Gerizim, the, Jew, the Jews said Jerusalem. What's the right place to worship? Jesus did not say, oh, you know, that controversy has been going on for a long time. You know, there's a lot of different viewpoints on that. I guess we'll just have to agree to disagree. Uh-uh. He said, Jerusalem, you're wrong, it's Jerusalem. Where was the answer? It was in Scripture, where it had always been. The Jews were right. 
They came to Jesus in Matthew 22, verse 17, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Does Jesus say, well, you know, that's, a, that's really a conundrum. You know, people, uh, people have different viewpoints on that. We can just agree to disagree. Uh-uh. The answer, it was lawful. It was lawful. The controversy about the resurrection. Was there a resurrection at the last day? The answer, yes, there was a resurrection. It was found in Scripture. God is the God, God was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was, he said, I am the God of. He does not say, I was the God of. People exist after they die. Therefore, a reunion with the body and the soul is, makes complete sense. It's very logical. Where was the answer? It was in Scripture. It would have been all along. The controversy about divorce, Matthew 19, 3. Is it lawful to divorce a, man, a, a woman for, for a man to put away his wife for every cause? I mean, you had two schools of thought on that, big controversy on that. What did, what did Jesus say? Have you not read? Where was the answer? In Scripture. Did you, you go back to Genesis. Why don't you look at the verses that surround the origin of marriage? Maybe that would tell you the answer. If God brought them together, if God says a man is to leave and cleave, then obviously, no, you're not just to leave. There it was, right in Scripture, where it had been all along. And it was a clear answer. The question about, Master, what should I do to gain eternal life? What's written in the law? Where's the answer? It's in Scripture. You know, I never find Jesus walking around trying to undermine God's law by giving a list of spiritual or doctrinal questions that there's no resolution. Some people seem to enjoy trying to find questions like that and put in the, them together in a list. See, these are all the things that Christians have disagreed about, and therefore any sort of unity based on Scripture is impossible. I don't, I don't ever find Jesus doing that. I don't ever find Jesus making a list of things that here are the doctrinal issues that cannot be resolved. Why do people do that then? And who are they listening to? Paul said, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, imitate Christ, follow Christ. If you're the type of person or if you're, or if you're enamored with people that like to dwell on controversy and, and, and like things to remain controversial and never find a clear answer, you're not following the steps of Jesus because Jesus never did that. When Jesus encountered controversy, he always found a clear answer to it. Then move on. There's the answer. Do it. Obey it. Move on. I tell you what. I want to spend my time doing what Jesus did. I want to spend my time opening up the Scriptures, finding the answer in Scripture, and enjoying the blessings of doing it, and hanging out with, hanging out with people that want to do the same thing. Are you like that? Are you tired of all the mumbo-jumbo in the world? Are you tired of all the people that can't give you a straight answer? Are you tired of all the people out there saying there's no such thing as truth and then wanting to enforce their own truth on you, the truth they made up? Are you tired of people saying you can't understand the Bible, but read my book? Are you trying to, trying, tired of people trying to make slaves of you, to follow them? Me too, me too. Can you understand the Bible? You bet you can understand the Bible. Can we understand it together? Can we understand it alike? You bet we can understand it alike. If you'd like to get together and study, just open up the Bible and look at what it says. Give us a call. Give Mark a call. 503-644-9017. You got a question? Send us an email. Go to our website, beaverinchurchofchrist.net. There's an email link there. Send, send, send me a question whatever question you have there. Well, until next time, until next time, it was good to spend some time with you. Again, open up the Bible. Don't live in confusion. Don't live in this kind of world of everything's gray. Find the truth. Find the light. And when you find the truth, obey it. Don't just be some seeker who's always seeking. 
Be someone who is willing to obey it when you find it. Again, the plan of salvation as we close is you need to hear the gospel, Romans 10, 17. You need to believe that Jesus is the Christ, John 3, 16. You need to be willing to repent and give up your sinful things that you're doing. Acts 2, 38, confess your faith in Christ, Romans 10, 9 and 10. Be baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, no ambiguity in that verse. Baptism now saves you. See you later.